Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have much pleasure in welcoming all of you to this 106th annual general meeting of your company, which I declare open since the requisite quorum is present. May I now introduce to you my colleagues on the board who are present on the dais. On my left, starting from the extreme end, Mr. Zafir Alam is a non-executive director of your company. Mr. Ashok Malik, non-executive director of your company. Mr. Arun Dugal, a non-executive director of your company. Mrs. Meera Shankar, a non-executive director of your company. Mr. S. B. Mathur, non-executive director of your company. Mr. Rajiv Tandon, whole time director and chief financial officer of your company. On my right, starting from the extreme end, Mr. Nakul Anand is a whole time director of your company. Mr. David Simpson, a non-executive director of your company. Mr. Habib Rahman, non-executive director of your company. Mr. S. B. Manak, non-executive director of your company. Mr. Sheel Bhadra Banerjee, a non-executive director of your company. I have now much pleasure in introducing to you Mr. Sanjeev Puri, who the board appointed as the chief executive officer of your company with effect from 5th February 2017, the day I assumed the role of non-executive chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, Whilst your company has built over the years a large bank of exceptionally talented managers across businesses and across the length and breadth of your company, it is the leadership that converts them into a dynamic team with a purpose and mission. That special role is now being played by Mr. Sanjeev Puri. All of us will rally behind him to realize our vision of serving our shareholders by effectively serving our society. I want you to put your hands together to extend to him a very special welcome at his first annual general meeting as the chief executive officer of your company. Mr. P. B. Ramanujam has not been able to attend due to health reasons and Mrs. Nirupama Rao is currently overseas due to a prior engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to also mention that Mr. Anil Bajal ceased to be a director of your company with effect from 30th December 2016, consequent to his appointment as Lieutenant Governor of Delhi. I take this opportunity to acknowledge his valuable contribution to your company. The financial statements of your company for the year ended 31st March 2017. The reports of the board and the auditors of your company, together with the secretarial audit report, the register of directors and key managers managerial personnel and their shareholding and the register of contracts or arrangements are available and will remain open and accessible for inspection during the continuance of this meeting. Certificate dated 26th May 2017 from Messrs. Deloitte, Haskins and Sells, the auditors of your company in respect of the company's employee stock option scheme is also placed before this meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, a few weeks ago, the NDA government, led by the Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, completed three years in office. On all counts, it has been an eventful journey. The rollout of the much-awaited goods and services tax, the radical step to demonetize high-value currency, the large-scale mobilization of Jandhan Yojana, the direct benefit transfer scheme, the rapid progress in highways and electrification are undoubtedly examples of inspired action towards progress. 
The spirit of competitive federalism has also spurred state governments to closely examine the ease of doing business. This in turn should positively impact the investment climate. climate. The Prime Minister's bold vision to shape a new confident India resonates deeply with your company's aspiration to be an exemplary Indian enterprise serving national priorities. This is manifest in ITC's relentless effort to build multiple engines of growth, create world-class Indian brands, invest in state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities, iconic tourism and hospitality products, and globally benchmarked intellectual property through state-of-the-art research and development. ITC's deep engagement with millions of farmers in rural India enables your company to pursue inclusive growth and generate sustainable livelihoods. Last year, in my annual address, I had spoken about the extraordinary transformation of your company into a multi-business, multi-dimensional Indian corporation inspired by our vision to put India first. I had also highlighted our aspiration for the future and the wide array of enterprise strengths built and nurtured over decades. These strengths will provide your company unique sources of competitive advantage going into the future, enabling us to make an even larger contribution to the national economy. One such enterprise strength that is closely linked to several of your company's businesses relates to ITC's century-old relationship with farmers and agriculture. This relationship has substantially deepened over the years with ITC's large and growing presence in businesses such as packaged foods, paper boards and paper, education and stationery products, and other fast-moving consumer goods. Your company's businesses in these segments add significant value to agriculture, a crucial sector that provides livelihoods to half of India's workforce. Today, in this annual address, I would like to highlight your company's integrated approach towards building an agri-based industry of the future. It is a matter of great satisfaction that your company's intervention in this area are intrinsically aligned to the Prime Minister's vision to double farmer incomes by 2022. Before I dwell on this theme, I would like to first present to you the highlights of your company's triple bottom line performance during the year gone by. Your company delivered a steady performance despite the sluggish demand environment and operating challenges arising out of the currency crunch during the part of the year. Gross revenue crossed the 55,000 crore mark and profit before tax surpassed the 15,000 crore level. The non-cigarette segment now accounts for 58% of the net segment revenue, having grown 18-fold since 1996, demonstrating the potential of a company's multiple drivers of growth. Today, the non-cigarette businesses deploy 77% of your company's operating capital and 88% of the employee base reflecting the radically transformed character of your company. You'll be happy to know that ITC remains amongst the top three corporates in the private sector in terms of contribution to the exchequer. In the last five years, this contribution aggregated nearly 1,40,000 crores. Currently, as much as 74% of the value addition by your company accrues to the exchequer. Your company continues to be one of the most valuable scripts on the Indian stock exchanges. Market cap touched levels of nearly 4 lakh crores recently, growing more than 72 times since 1996. During this period, total shareholder returns grew rapidly at a compound annual growth rate of 24%, outperforming the Sensex, which posted a growth rate of around 11%. Annual consumer spend on the brands from the new FMCG businesses are now at nearly 14,000 crores. These world-class Indian brands 
not only capture the entire value in the national economy, but also anchor competitive value chains that create sustainable livelihoods. Several state-of-the-art integrated consumer goods manufacturing and logistics facilities are being built across the country to enable the FMCG businesses to rapidly scale up, supporting the nation's Make in India mission. During the year, three such company-owned world-class manufacturing assets were commissioned to cater to the foods and personal care products businesses. Your company remains the only enterprise in the world of comparable dimensions to have been carbon positive, water positive, and solid waste recycling positive for over a decade. Renewable energy consumption touched 48%, bringing us closer to the goal of ensuring that half of the energy requirements of ITC is from renewable sources. Your company's businesses create sustainable livelihoods for over 60 lakh people. It is within the realm of possibility today to envisage that ITC will be able to support over 100 lakh sustainable livelihoods by 2030, coinciding with our aspiration to register a revenue of 1 lakh crores from the new fast-moving consumer goods businesses. This year, your company was privileged to be conferred the Porter Prize for 2017 in two categories, one for creating shared value and the other for corporate governance. It was an honor to receive the recognition from the hands of Professor Michael Porter himself, who continues to be a leading light at the Harvard Business School and one of the globe's most prolific management visionaries. In addition, your company's sustainability initiatives continue to receive several prestigious awards such as the India Today Safaigiri Award and the Asian CSR Award. I must also take this opportunity to thank the government of West Bengal for honoring me with their highest civilian award, the Banga Bibhushan. I, thank you, thank you. I'm grateful to CNBC TV 18 and Business Standard for bestowing on me their Lifetime Achievement Awards. <clears throat> Thank you. To me, these recognitions are also a tribute to the relentless effort put in by the committed team of ITC, and I would like to convey my gratitude to them as well as to you, our shareholders, for your continued support over the years. Let me now turn to the theme of today's address. To say that agriculture is the lifeline of India's economy would be an understatement. There is no other sector that is as critical for the country's development and at the same time so besieged by its myriad challenges. Agriculture engages nearly half of India's workforce and provides food security to the nation's 1.3 billion people. It also provides livelihoods to more than 70% of rural households. Agrarian distress, therefore, can cripple the lives of millions. Agriculture is the most vulnerable to the vagaries of nature and the threat of climate change. As it stands today, agriculture consumes around 90% of the country's renewable fresh water, a fifth of total electricity, and a significant part of government subsidies. Yet this sector contributes less than 15% to GDP. It is therefore not surprising that the farmer's per capita income is less than one-fifth of the country's average. Given the various pressures on finite land for food, fiber, forest, fodder, and factories, the per capita availability of arable land in India has been declining over the years and at a much sharper pace than that of Brazil and China. Most alarmingly, as the government's economic survey has pointed out, the agriculture sector's consumption of renewable fresh water far surpasses the 60% level in Brazil and China. Productivity of the main food grains, such as rice and wheat, is substantially lower than that of these countries. Multiple levels of intermediation in the regulated markets have also led to a much smaller share of consumer spend reaching the farmer. 
The cumulative impact of all this is that farmers continue to be trapped in a vicious circle of low growth in income and productivity. More often than not, they accumulate huge loans which they are in no position to repay. Half a century ago, the Green Revolution provided the first big leap for Indian agriculture and food security. The country became self-sufficient in food and from a net importer of grains, it transformed into a net exporter. The government's strong interventions in creating instruments like the minimum support price assured farmers of economic returns. Institutions like the Food Corporation of India supported the implementation of MSP, complementing the research and extension services by institutions like the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. A public distribution system created fair price shops to sell essential food items at affordable prices. Subsequently, the White Revolution also transformed milk production and created immense value for farmers. However, what got us here is not going to take us to the next destination. In these 50 years, the context for food and agriculture has changed quite radically. So have the ground conditions in terms of a tiring public infrastructure, serious water stress, and a growing threat of global warming. This reality necessitates new thinking, new research, new institutions, and most importantly, a market-driven approach that will support sustainable agriculture and ensure remunerated returns to farmers. In such a challenging scenario, the vision enunciated by the Prime Minister to double farmer incomes by 2022 is indeed laudable and provides an unparalleled opportunity to usher in the next agricultural revolution. Having stated this, it promises to be an extremely challenging task. Farmer incomes will need to be doubled without unduly raising consumer prices, even as input costs continuously rise. At the same time, challenges will emerge from a depleting natural resource base and extreme weather events. This increases the complexity manifold and quite clearly requires the bandwidth of a mutually reinforcing partnership among the government, corporates, farmers, and other stakeholders. To my mind, the vision to double farmer incomes provides a great opportunity for extensive corporate participation in agriculture and rural development. The corporate sector can add a unique dimension given the power of private entrepreneurship, its capacity to innovate, its wide variety of skill sets, as well as its ability to reach markets more efficiently. Winning brands representing products and services linked to the agri and rural sector provide the anchors that can drive the competitiveness of the value chains for the ultimate benefit of farmers. A large degree of corporate involvement in agriculture is also imperative given the changing context of the food and agriculture sector. Today's consumers, influenced by rapid globalization and with increasing purchasing power, are seeking superior nutritional and taste benefits, better hygiene and convenience. The share of cereals in diets across socioeconomic strata is reducing in favor of fruits, vegetables, meat, and milk. Demand for value-added processed foods is also on the rise. Increasing awareness of health and wellness is also generating demand for a wider variety of grains. This calls for a fundamental transformation for the farmer from selling whatever is produced to producing what the consumer wants. Such demand-driven value chains can bring enormous benefit to the farmer if they are able to align production to market signals. Increasing crop productivity alone is not sufficient to raise farmer incomes if market signals do not support such production. Therefore, huge investment is required for creating an ecosystem that, among others, involves infrastructure that spans post-harvest logistics, processing, packaging, retailing, and information systems. Such investments with large corporate participation 
will create a win-win opportunity and enhance farmer incomes. India's colossal agri-wastage is estimated at 92,000 crores. A large part of this wastage is in perishables. The increasing consumer demand for fruits, vegetables and other perishables can benefit farmers given the higher remuneration in these value-added categories. In addition, a higher level of food processing in the economy can create a much larger pull for quality agri-commodities, thereby reducing farm wastages and raising farm incomes. This calls for investment in product-specific climate-controlled infrastructure, as well as branded products that can win consumer franchise. In addition to crop expansion, diversification into off-farm activities such as animal husbandry and livestock can also supplement farmer incomes. Corporate participation is essential not only to invest in requisite infrastructure but also to provide assured and value-added markets to farmers. Technology can play a very critical role in raising farm yields, enhancing nutritional quality of food, climate-proofing agri-production and conserving natural resources. Drought and flood-resistant seeds can de-risk farmers from the impact of climate change. Partnerships leveraging the corporate sector's research institutions and governments can significantly accelerate the introduction of new technologies for sustainable agriculture. Preserving natural resources, particularly water and topsoil, is critical in ensuring the sustainability of agriculture. Corporate involvement in spreading best practices and know-how, apart from creating common infrastructural assets, will go a long way in securing the future of farmers. Apart from food processing, one of the most powerful means of creating livelihoods and rural prosperity lies in the wood-based value chain. From construction industry to fiber for the paper industry to furniture, sports goods, home and office interiors, accessories and even biomass energy, wood-based industries have tremendous economic potential apart from being an employment multiplier. The agroforestry sector as a source of raw material for wood-based industry is woefully constrained by policies that don't only prevent job creation in India but promote avoidable imports. India currently imports a significant part of its demand for wood and wood-based products given a regime of near-zero import duties. Taken together with a policy framework that does not permit corporate farming, it leaves the hapless farmer to compete with automated farms overseas. Such a policy regime makes imported wood far more competitive than growing trees in India. Consequently, jobs are exported to countries that grow trees and sell wood-based value-added products. By providing crucial policy support, the entire wood-based value chain can substantially support rural livelihoods and create new opportunities for farmers and skilled artisans that add value to wood. Your company's extensive engagement in the agri, food and paper sectors has given us the opportunity to make a growing contribution towards raising farm incomes and improving quality of life in the geographies where we operate. Let me give you a glimpse of some of these interventions. Your company's strategy in pursuing an integrated rural development program seeks to achieve three important objectives. One, by sophisticated food processing, ITC aims to create a premium for value-added agriculture as well as reduce agri-wastage, thereby building the sustainable competitive capacity of agricultural communities. Second, through innovative interventions, your company seeks to preserve and replenish environmental resources. And third, by developing market for higher value product produce and through grassroots capacity building, your company enables the creation of larger scale sustainable livelihoods. At the core of your company's agri-interventions is the globally acknowledged ITC eChopal, launched in early 2000. Conceived 
as an innovative market-led business model embedded with social goals, the ITC eChapal empowers farmers and triggers a virtuous cycle of higher productivity and higher income through a multitude of interventions. Much before the internet became prevalent in rural areas, ITC leveraged the power of digital technology to empower small and marginal farmer with a host of services related to know-how, best practices, timely and relevant weather information, transparent discovery of prices, access to quality agri-inputs at competitive prices and so on. By connecting farmers to markets and enabling price discovery, they are liberated from exploitative middlemen. The eChopal system also enables efficient transmission of market signals, helping farmers align their produce with the needs of the market. To date, over 4 million farmers have benefited from this initiative, enhancing rural incomes. The ITC eChopal has been a case study at the Harvard Business School for many years now and is taught in more than 400 universities across the world. Going forward, the ITC Chopal will continue to engage with farmers in innovative ways, creating new opportunities to progressively raise rural incomes. Enhancing agriculture productivity is a critical prerequisite for raising farmer remuneration. Recognizing this need, the ITC eChopal promotes sustainable agricultural practices among small and marginal farmers through multiple demonstration farms. Backed by intensive research in collaboration with leading institutions, this initiative provides agri-extension services that are qualitatively superior and helps farmers secure value addition and productivity gains. The services are customized to meet local conditions ensure timely availability of farm inputs, facilitate insurance and credit, and provide know-how through a cluster of farmer schools that capture indigenous knowledge. Over time, these interventions have contributed to raising productivity and diversification of the portfolio of crops. Small farmers are extremely vulnerable to the threat of climate change. Your company's sustainable agriculture initiative aims to mitigate the risks arising from erratic and extreme weather events through the promotion of climate-smart agricultural practices. Farmer field schools in 60 districts across 16 states have disseminated advanced agri-practices. Promotion of efficient agri-practices agri such as zero tillage, broadbed furrow together with adoption of appropriate mechanization have contributed significantly to farm productivity. Going forward, your company has identified 900 core villages where an integrated program will build capabilities to help transform the future of the surrounding rural communities. Water is the lifeline of agriculture. Unfortunately, more than 54% of agriculture is now under significant water stress. Your company's soil and moisture conservation program works with local agricultural communities to develop and manage local water resources, particularly in water stressed areas. This large scale intervention in water stewardship covers 45 districts across 12 states and has brought the area under watershed to over 7,76,000 acres through more than 10,000 water harvesting structures. In addition, four large-scale riverbed regeneration projects for aquifer recharge are underway in select areas in Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, and Karnataka to strengthen water security. Several private-public people partnerships are being implemented in collaboration with state governments demonstrating the robustness of your company's watershed development intervention. These projects are also aligned to the outcomes envisaged in the Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sinchai Yojana and will help in supporting per drop more crop mission. Competitive value chains linked to agriculture can transform 
the farm sector and contribute to rural prosperity. The synergy derived from ITC's agri-sourcing capabilities, together with your company's deep consumer insight, cuisine expertise, manufacturing excellence, branding, trade marketing, and distribution infrastructure has provided unique sources of competitive advantage to your company's foods business. In a short span of a decade or so, ITC's foods business has already become the third largest in the country and is well on its way to occupy the leadership position in the not too distant future. Your company's vibrant and successful food brands like Kitchens of India, Ashirwad, Sunfeast, Yippee, Bingo, Be Natural, among others, have created powerful drivers to anchor competitive agri value chains from farm to the consumer, making a meaningful contribution to farmer empowerment. Your company's agri-sourcing capabilities together with the expertise resting in ITC's hotels chefs have been a source of competitive advantage in the successful launch of your company's Febel brand of luxury chocolates and the Sunbeam brand of premium coffee. Your company has also recently launched the ITC MasterChef brand of super safe spices, which are tested for over 470 contaminants as per the highest and most stringent international standards. These spices have been developed in a unique partnership with farmers through an integrated crop development program, creating new standards of safety and excellence, thereby bringing to the Indian consumer the world's finest standards of safety. India's massive agri-wastages have deprived farmers of a potentially large income source. ITC has decided to foray into the fruits, vegetables, and other perishable segment. Investments are underway to create climate-controlled infrastructure for an efficient supply chain to unlock the potential latent in this area. Such fresh, frozen, and dehydrated agri-products will provide high-quality options to consumers, creating an agri-value chain that will help farmers diversify crop production as well as manage wastage. Investments have also been made in farming for aromatic and medicinal plants, keeping in mind ITC's focus on agri-based health and wellness products. The ITC MasterChef frozen prawns have already been launched in select markets and will shortly be rolled out nationally. These high-quality, super-safe prawns leverage ITC's 45-year legacy in exporting to the most exacting markets in the world. Under the Afforestation Initiative, your company has worked extensively with farmers to green over 6,20,000 acres to date. Most significantly, this program has generated over 113 million person days of employment among poor tribals, marginal farmers, and farm workers. Integral to this program, is an agroforestry initiative that has been expanded to over 21,000 acres, ensuring food fodder and wood security. Agroforestry also helps in de-risking the farmer through additional production of crops within the same land area, ensuring alternative sources of remuneration. This fiber value chain linked to ITC's paper, packaging, and education and stationary businesses also anchors the supply chain to a secure source of demand, thereby encouraging farmers to adopt a longer-term approach to agroforestry. The Forestation Initiative contributes to the carbon sequestration and soil conservation objectives of our country and constitutes a significant part of your company's environmental stewardship. To strengthen the farming community's capabilities in securing alternative and sustainable livelihoods, your company has spearheaded a number of programs to help farmers diversify their economic activities. This includes a livestock development program that adds a significant source of income to farming communities. To date, this intervention has covered over 15 lakh milch animals. In addition, your company's women empowerment program, particularly focusing on ultra-poor women, enables development of entrepreneurial skills 
besides making available assets for income generation. Over 46,000 women were linked to individual bank accounts under the Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana and life insurance schemes under the Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana and the Suraksha Bhima Yojana. Further, ITC's skilling and vocational training program spread over 29 districts in 17 states has enrolled over 43,000 youth to provide them with market-linked skills. Looking to the future, ITC's primary education program is also providing children from weaker sections access to education with focus on learning outcomes and retention. Cumulatively, over 5 lakh children have benefited from this program. Your company believes that it is critical to invest in developing world-class Indian brands that can help create, capture and retain larger value within our country. Strong Indian food brands with deep agri-linkages at the back end can significantly add market-led value to Indian farm sector. Your company has invested in a globally benchmarked life sciences and technology center in Bengaluru with 350 world-class scientists, the center is helping shape a new future in agri-sciences and biosciences, contributing to value addition in the agricultural sector. Around 20 state-of-the-art integrated consumer goods manufacturing and logistics facilities are under various stages of development and will, over time, create food processing and manufacturing centers of excellence to support the scale-up of your company's agri-based businesses. The collective power resident in all the initiatives I have enumerated will make a substantial and growing contribution to developing the potential in the agricultural sector. In effect, it will add your company's might in supporting the Prime Minister's vision to double farmer incomes and multiply sustainable livelihoods. Fifty years ago, in completely different circumstances, Government spearheaded the Green Revolution. Today the context has changed and true transformation of the agricultural sector will require a larger role to be played by market-based institutions. More so because the changing pattern of consumption requires a far larger number of agricultural items to be brought under the purview of institutions and instruments that seek to provide food and farmer security. It may not be pragmatic to expect the MSV framework of your to alone deliver today's dynamic requirements, especially given the huge cost involved and the avoidable market distortions. More often than not, farmers rely on obsolete demand supply information of prior years. As a result, they are extremely vulnerable to price volatility given changing demand patterns at the time of harvesting. Commodity derivatives, particularly options, are good safeguards as they can assure farmers a post-harvest price even before a decision is taken on what to sow. Options help align production to market signals, enabling income security and better price realization, whether they transact directly or through aggregators. It is heartening that recent reforms have now permitted options. I must congratulate SEBI for this positive step forward and hope that in due course, several commodities will be transacted through the designated exchanges. Meaningful investments by the corporate sector in agriculture have been constrained by the uncertainties inherent in several market-restrictive policies. The Essential Commodities Act, with its power to impose stock limits and curb movements, is a case in point. A new model APMC Act has been unveiled by the central government and one hopes that the states will hasten to implement its recommendation. Unless such reforms are readily adopted, it will constrain corporate participation in this sector. This will indeed be unfortunate as it will deprive the rural economy of a major force multiplier. Given the tremendous potential of the food processing industry, to transform the future of the agricultural sector and create jobs, it is critical that this sector is allowed to grow faster with strong policy impetus. 
the current levels of processing of less than 10% is way behind that of major food processing countries. Unfortunately, there seems to be a view that packaged branded foods is a source of elitist consumption. Therefore, the tax structure does not treat it as providing impetus to the agricultural economy. The tax incidence on food processing must be viewed from the perspective that it adds tremendous value to farmers and helps in ameliorating huge agri-wastage. A conducive taxation regime for the processed food industry will be crucial to multiplying farmer and rural incomes, besides creating large-scale jobs at the intersection of agriculture and industry. It has been your company's resolve to build an institution for India that will truly be an engine of growth for the national economy. ITC's unshakable commitment to serve national priorities enjoins on us the responsibility to ensure that this growth is inclusive, creates meaningful, sustainable livelihoods, and a secure ecological environment. A deep sense of patriotic fervor inspires ITC to continuously strive against all odds to create a national institution of pride. Your company has indeed traversed a remarkable journey of transformation to create an incredible Indian conglomerate with boundless potential. I have tremendous faith in ITC's world-class team of dedicated professionals. I know that they will leave no stone unturned in their continuing quest to take this company forward to new heights, to serve our society and you, our shareholders. As always, may I once again, on behalf of the board, thank you for your continued support and encouragement. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's put India first.